Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's RNA Collaborative Seminar. We are hosting you from the Institute of Molecular Biology and the Johannes Gutenberg University, both located in Mainz, Germany. My name is Shamita Govind. I'm a graduate student at the Institute of Molecular Biology, and I will be the moderator for this evening. We have two speakers today. Each of them have a talk for about 25 minutes, after which you, the audience, will have five minutes to ask some questions. Please use the, the Q&A button uh, and type in your questions in the chat, and I will read it out to the speakers on your behalf. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Erin Sternberg, a postdoctoral fellow in the group of Dorothy Dorman of JGU Mines. Before joining us in Mines, Erin was a graduate student at the University of California, Riverside, where she was working with RNA binding proteins in cell adhesion and migration. As a postdoc in the Dorman lab, Erin is looking at how misregulation of RNA binding proteins lead to certain neurodegenerative disorders. We're very excited to hear about your work, Erin, and with this, I invite you to start your seminar. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me, and then let me just start my presenter mode. So um, can everybody see my screen okay? Everything's looking fine? Looks great. Yeah, okay, perfect. So let me just turn my laser pointer on. All right, great. So um, like was mentioned before, my name is Erin, and I'm a postdoc in Dorothy Dorman's group here at JGU Mines. Uh, and yeah, I'll just go ahead and jump right in. So so the work in our lab is focused on the molecular mechanisms of two neurodegenerative diseases, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and frontal temporal dementia, or FTD. ALS is a rapid onset disease characterized by degeneration of motor cortex and uh, spinal cord neurons, leading eventually to muscle weakness uh, and eventual paralysis of the patient. Whereas FTD is characterized by degeneration of the frontal and temporal cortex, leading to changes in personality and language over time. And while these two diseases have very distinct presentations of pathology, they, they share many molecular signatures and uh, nowadays are thought to represent two extremes of a continuum of a broader spectrum of neurodegenerative disorder. And so one of these molecular hallmarks that we see in these neurodegenerative diseases is the mislocalization of normally RNA binding, normally nuclear RNA binding proteins uh, into the cytoplasm. And so an example of this is shown here where um, we have SUS, which will be the, 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 the main protein that I discuss in my talk. Uh, and in a normal healthy neuron, SUS would be located predominantly in the nucleus. However, if we look uh, at the post-mortem brain tissue of ALS and FTD patients, what we see is FUS has been uh, removed from the nucleus and now is found in the cytoplasm and is found in these pathological or what we believe to be pathological aggregates. And although the mechanism of this mislocalization and aggregation is not entirely clear, one possible theory is this two-hit model of, of pathology. And so this starts with healthy neurons where this RNA binding protein is localized to the nucleus. However, then there is some trigger that can lead to an increase in the amount of cytoplasmic localization of this RBP. And so in some cases, this trigger is mutations that have uh, occurred in the protein or maybe even familial mutations. Uh, but this can also be tr triggered by cellular stress, which drives many nuclear RNA binding proteins out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. And when the RNA binding protein is in the cytoplasm during times of cellular stress, uh, these, these RBPs are then recruited into stress granules, which are liquid-like membraneless compartments, which at the beginning uh, and without persistent stress or aging are thought to be liquid and reversible. However, over time and through persistent stress or through the aging process of the neurons, these stress granules can persist and become irreversible aggregates in the cell. And so these are thought to be the precursors of the aggregates that we see in the postmortem post brain. And so uh, one of the main ALS and FDD associated RNA binding proteins is the FUS protein, which I'll be talking about. 
And so FUS is a pretty interesting RNA binding protein in that it's implicated in many steps of RNA processing and regulation. And so since it's predominantly nuclear, most of its well-studied functions are in the nucleus where um, it participates in processes such as DNA damage. It's one of the, the first proteins to be recruited to DNA damage sites. Um, but it also has really well-characterized roles in splicing and in transcription, as well as uh, microRNA biogenesis and processing. However, in most uh, healthy cells, there is a subset of FUS that is found in the cytoplasm. So FUS is small enough that it can just drift through the nuclear pore complex. And so at any given time, you know, just a small fraction of FUS it remains in the cytoplasm. And here um, we see that uh, FUS uh, can be, it has been implicated as a translational repressor, but um, also FUS may play a role in um, the recruitment of nuclear transport granules. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, FUS can be recruited into stress granules during times of cellular stress, although the role of FUS within these stress granules is still unclear. And then in this diagram, I also want to point out that the, that the driving force for FUS's nuclear localization is through its interaction with its nuclear import receptor, transportin-1. So transportin-1 is kind of continuously bringing FUS uh, back into the nucleus in the cell. And just a little uh, explanation of the architecture, the domain architecture of FUS. So FUS consists of a N-terminal low complexity domain, which has mostly been studied in the context of FUS's ability to self-associate or to phase separate, but it's likely a site of interactions for other binding partners of FUS as well. And then there is a set of C-terminal RNA binding domains two of these being well-structured, somewhat classical RNA binding domains, which are the RRM and the zinc finger domain of FUS. Uh, and these folded domains are surrounded by three intrinsically, intrinsically disordered RGG domains, which, uh, yeah, surround these motifs. And then uh, finally, at the far C-terminal end of FUS is the nuclear localization signal, which is responsible for the binding and recruitment of transportin-1. And uh, there's already been a fair amount of research uh, done uh, into the RNA binding modes of FUS. So um, a structure has already been solved showing that the RRM and the zinc finger domain of FUS can recognize structured RNAs in a somewhat sequence specific way. So the RRM is capable of binding to the single stranded region of a stem loop structure, whereas the zinc finger domain can bind to GGU rich uh, normally single stranded motifs. And then um, other studies have shown that the positive charge of the RGG domains contribute to the recruitment of RNAs uh, in a sequence non-specific way, so more so uh, via these uh, electrostatic interactions with the negative charge of the RNA and the positive charge of the arginine. And so, as I mentioned before, these motifs are highly disordered and of low sequence complexity, these RGG motifs. In addition, to their role in RNA binding, these motifs are also the sites which drive phase separation of FUS, um, where we see that the arginines in the C-terminal end can interact with tyrosines uh, on the N-terminal end, and uh, these uh, engage in pi pi and pi cation interactions that uh, lead to the self-association that drives phase separation. And finally, these motifs, as suggested earlier, uh, with the degenerate specificity, ah, sorry, with the degenerate specificity of RNA recognition, um, these can interact. The RGG motifs can interact with a broad spectrum of RNA classes, and these multivalent interactions uh, can, in part, drive the assembly of RNP complexes and RNP granules. And so, many ALS-associated mutations have been found to occur within the FUS gene. And a subset of these mutations, as uh, seen in pink here, lie within the NLS of FUS. Uh, and some of these mutations are a bit more well studied uh, in that they're known to disrupt the transportin binding uh, and lead to cytoplasmic mislocalization, which serves as this first hit of the two hit model. But there are another large class of mutations which lie within the RGD domains of FUS. And for a lot of these mutations, it's not clear how these mutations can lead to disease. And so the focus of my research is to understand how the RGG motifs are contributing to the cellular behavior and function of us, 
and then eventually uh, be able to use this knowledge to tie back uh, their to their role in disease. And uh, to kind of first tackle this problem, I created um, a set of mutants. And so I'll just briefly take a moment to, to go over them because they'll come up a lot in the remainder of my talk. And so uh, we, of course, have just normal wild type fuss here. Um, I also have a mutant of fuss where I've introduced uh, a single point mutation into the nuclear localization signal. This is called the P525L mutation. And this is a well studied and well-documented disease-related uh, point mutation, which uh, disrupts transport and binding and leads to FUS's cytoplasmic accumulation. I also have a RNA binding domain mutant. So this MRBD uh, is a mutant where I've introduced point mutations in these kind of classical RNA binding domains of FUS, so the RRM and the zinc finger, such that RNA binding is diminished. Uh, however, the, the secondary structures that are formed through these domains are not affected. Then I have the KGG mutant, where all arginines within the RGG motif, within RGG domains, uh, are mutated to lysines. And this is considered um, kind of a mild or an intermediate type of mutation in that I'm substituting one positively charged amino acid for another positively charged amino acid. However, this is not to say that the mutation itself is, um, you know, analogous or so that these two amino acids are analogous because, say, for example, uh, this KGG mutant can no longer undergo phase separation in the same way that wild type plus can. So um, there are different chemistries of these two amino acids. Um, and then I have an AGG, which is the most severe of all of the mutants that I've created, where um, the arginines in these RGG motifs have been replaced with alanines. And this completely eliminates the positive charge associated with these domains. And so then I can uh, transiently transect these constructs into FUS knockout HeLa cells. So this will be the only version of FUS that's present in these cells. Uh, and then I can either um, add or not add a cellular stress, but for the sake of this talk, all the conditions that I have are upon addition of a, a cellular stress. And then um, I fix, permeabilize, and do immunofluorescence of these different cells and image them with confocal microscopy in order to see if I can see any changes in FUS's general behaviors, um, you know, through localization and whatnot. And so the first uh, the first, you know, characteristic that I decided to look at was the localization of FUS with these different mutants. And so uh, what you can see here is first for wild type FUS uh, here in the green channel. And FUS, uh, wild type FUS has this uh, normal nuclear localization, as you can see, is overlapped with DAPI, which is in the blue channel, which is things for the nucleus. Um, and the cytoplasm is marked here by the G3BB1 channel. Then we have this P525L mutant, again, kind of serves as a, as a control. It's uh, already been well documented that this mutation leads to increased cytoplasmic localization of FUS. But then we have this RNA binding domain mutant uh, that doesn't seem to uh, have any noticeable mislocalization phenotype, uh, at least compared to wild types in our ham. However, when we introduce these lysine mutations, so the KGG mutant, we start to see this intermediate phenotype where a portion of the cells still display a nuclear localization. However, there is this subpopulation of cells, which now we can see there's a pretty severe, severe mislocalization. And then finally, the AGG, which is our most severe mutation, has the most severe mislocalization phenotype in that all cells that are expressing this construct uh, have almost all of their uh, fuss located out into the cytoplasm. And so when we uh, saw this, we kind of thought that there could be two possible hypotheses for what was causing this mislocalization. One of them is that there is an increased nuclear egress of fuss out of the nucleus. So as I had mentioned before, fuss can just uh, drift through the nuclear pore complex and go out into the cytoplasm. And so we thought maybe if fuss is no longer able to bind to its RNA targets in the nucleus, that this increased drift would explain the mislocalization that we see. But then the other side of this or the other hypothesis that we could have is that um, 
rather fuss uh, there's been a disruption in FUS's ability to interact with its transport, transport receptor, and so actually FUS is just no longer being pulled into the nucleus after uh, it leaves. And so we uh, first started with addressing this first hypothesis. Uh, and here, what I am showing is just kind of these classical gel shift assays where um, the target RNA that I'm using in this case is one of these really well-characterized RNA binding sites for FUS. And so here for wild type, you can see that uh, FUS binds really readily to this target RNA. And if we uh, mutate the folded domain, so this mRNA binding domain mutant, as well as the KGG mutants seem to have not a completely loss, but like a partial loss of function in their ability to bind RNA. And surprisingly, this AGG mutant, uh, despite the fact that both of the, the RRM losing finger domain are still intact, um, it completely loses its ability to bind RNA. And so this was actually uh, quite striking to us when we first saw this, because uh, we didn't really expect this phenotype to be so severe. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then the, the same result was achieved through a different assay. So this is the fluorescence polarization assay. Uh, but again, we see pretty nice binding for wild type FUS and then diminished binding for both the RNA binding domain mutant as well as the KGG and then completely abrogated binding for the AGG. And so looking back at the, the phenotypes that we see in cells, uh, this doesn't track completely with what we see. So especially when it comes to the RNA binding domain mutant, where we don't really see a localization, mislocalization phenotype, um, we do see defects in RNA binding. And so uh, we reasoned that just nuclear egress on its own could not fully explain the phenotype that we see. And so then we turned to nuclear import to see if we could see any disruptions in these processes. And this is a experiment that's done by another member of the group, uh, Saskia Hutton, and she can set up these uh, import assays in semi-permeabilized cells. And so the, the setup of this assay is that you add digitonin to cells such that, that the plasma membrane becomes semi-permeabilized, but the nuclear membrane of these cells remains intact. And so this is in a, in a fixed cell system. Um, and once you have this set up, you can wash out the cytosol, including any of the you know, native nuclear transport receptors and any other proteins. And then you can add back in what, whatever you want, and you can see uh, whether or not these proteins are transported with the, the given transport receptor you give them. So for the case, uh, in our experiments, it's going to be FUS uh, with the addition of transportin plus RAN and ATP in order to drive the import process. And so uh, this is just the example of what this assay looks like for wild type FUS. So uh, before adding transportin, you can see that wild type FUS is in the cytoplasm because this is where we add this recombinant protein in. But then upon addition of transportin, you can see that uh, wild type FUS is effectively recruited into the nucleus. However, for both the KGG and the AGG mutant FUS, this, this process is severely diminished, whereas we don't see uh, this lack of import in the RNA binding domain mutant. So this seems to be imported at about the same levels as wild type. Uh, another way to kind of uh, tackle this is, uh, question is uh, we did uh, in vitro pull down assays where we can immobilize recombinant FUS onto beads, and then we incubate this bus with uh, recombinant transportin. And then upon centrifugation, we can see if we can fish out or you know pull down transportin uh, with the fuss that's added. And so this is uh, kind of the, the end gel of what these uh, experiments look like. And so I'll just draw your attention uh, to the bands pointed here in the green arrow. And so wild type KGG and the RNA binding domain mutants seem to have uh, pretty good and pretty normal levels of their ability to just pull down and bind to transportin. However, the, the AGG mutant is completely deficient in this ability. And since this was our most severe mutant with the most severe phenotype, we further separated the, the mutations of this construct into the three separate RGG domains. So now uh, in this pull down assay, what we have is uh, just single domain uh, mutations of arginines to alanines. And what you can see uh, through this is uh, the, the, the 
wild type AGG1 and AGG2 constructs seem to have pretty normal abilities to bind to transportin. However, this AGG3 is severely diminished. And so uh, we think that this lack, this uh, decreased interaction with transportin and uh, probably these defects in import are driven through transportin's interactions with this third RGG domain, which is not so surprising because this is also the RGG domain that sits immediately adjacent to the NLS. Good. So looking again back at these uh, two models that we have. So um, in the end, what the, the solution that we kind of came to uh, is really a combination of both of these models, where um, when you have wild type plus, there's normal import and normal RNA binding. And so you get normal nuclear localization of FUS, uh, whereas this, for this mutant RNA binding domain FUS, uh, you have still have normal imports, but a bit reduced uh, RNA binding. However, this isn't uh, sufficient of a phenotype enough to really drive FUS out into the cytoplasm. And so you still get this normal nuclear localization. With the KGG, now we have reduced import and also reduced RNA binding. And so this is where we start getting this intermediate phenotype where some of the cells are, you know, present with this mislocalization, whereas others do not. And then finally, for the AGG, we have highly reduced import and also completely abolished RNA binding. And so uh, in these cells, you, you completely lose the ability for FUS to be recruited uh, back into the nucleus and stay there. Okay, and so then for the, the last uh, bit of my talk, I just wanna briefly mention some of the observations that we also see in terms of FUS's recruitment to stress granules. So again, these stress granules are thought to be the precursors of these pathological aggregates once FUS is mislocalized into the cytoplasm. And so we wanted to see if uh, the RGD, uh, these RGG motifs were playing any role in this recruitment. And so just to, uh, orient you at the, the difference of this assay. So now the constructs that I have are all um, introduced in, in the context and in the background of this P525L mutation. And what this does is it ensures that at the beginning of the assay, all of these mutants are equally cytoplasmically mislocalized. So they're, they're all pulled out of the nucleus to begin with equally. And so then we can just assess their recruitment to stress granules independent of this mislocalization phenotype. But the setup of the assay is quite similar. So we transfect these uh, constructs into FUS knockout HeLa cells we, with the addition of a cellular stress. And then uh, we do uh, immunofluorescence and confocal imaging to see the recruitment to these stress granules. And so uh, first, if we just look at the P525L alone, um, the stress granules here are marked in this G3BP1 channel, which is a, a known core component of stress granules. And you can see that FUS is really nicely recruited to these stress granules as, as is expected uh, in its behavior. The RNA binding domain mutant uh, seems to also be recruited quite well to these stress granules, which is um, kind of interesting that, um, yeah, that it seems, at least in this context, that these the, the interactions with these RNA binding domains might be mitigated, don't seem to be so important, at least uh, in the ability of us to be recruited to this particular granule. Um, however, the KGG uh, to some extent, and then of course the AGG to a very severe extent, uh, loses the ability to recruit to these stress granules. So we still see them forming in these cells, so it doesn't seem like such is like a required component for stress granule formation, which is in agreement with previous literature. Um, however, uh, we, we lose the ability of us to be recruited here. And so just to, just to wrap things up, um, yeah, uh, as my, the title of my talk also suggests, uh, the RGG motifs uh, are capable of governing the nuclear localization of FUS, as well as its RNA binding roles, uh, and then stress granule recruitment down the line when it's in the cytoplasm. And so um, we could imagine that this disruption and mislocalization could act as the first hit of this two-hit model of neurodegeneration. Although um, 
it, the caveat of this is that the, the mutations that I've introduced are much more severe than the disease associated ones. So, you know, I've introduced many arginine mutations and substitutions, whereas a lot of these are just point mutations. And so uh, further work in the group will kind of aim to, to test more relevant disease associated uh, mutations in that context. And with that, I would like to, to thank all the members of my group. Uh, it's a really supportive and wonderful environment uh, that I have over here. Um, and so I'm really thankful for the opportunity to, to be working with all these really wonderful people. And then my collaborators uh, and my funding, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Erin, that was a really great talk. We have a couple of questions for you in the chat. Um, first one is by David or Davide, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but thanks for your talk and congratulations on your work. Could you kindly explain again, how does the import assay work? Yeah, um, yeah, so what, uh, I'll explain it in like my, in my naive way because I, I myself uh, haven't really been doing it, but what, what the setup is is that we, uh, that, Sophia will fix these cells, so you grow them, you know, on a glass slide, and then you can fix them and add digitonin to the cells so that uh, at a ratio that, you know, and this is, I think, the part of this assay that's quite finicky, is such that the plasma membrane, the outer membrane of the cell becomes semi-permeable, but the nuclear membrane remains fully intact. And so because of this, you can then add back in components and see so in this case for, you know, you can really add back in anything, but for this case, it would be FUS and transportin, uh, and then you can see whether or not transportin is capable of, of importing FUS. And so these are recombinant proteins that we prep, you know, on the side. Thank you. Um, another question by Xiao Hong Guang. Nice talk. I'm wondering whether HeLa cell is a good system to model neuronal cells. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Um, so we use HeLa cells in a lot of the imaging that we do because they're they're they have really nice big cytoplasms and they are in general very easy to work with. However, in some of the downstream uh, kind of target analysis, so for example, now with these mutants, I want to do a set of uh, clip sequencing experiments. I have then moved these experiments into uh, an SHSY5Y line, which is a neuroblastoma cell line, which is a bit more uh, disease relevant. I agree. Great. Um, next question by Frank Slack. How do you plan to model the C's associated mutations, induced neurons from patient iPSCs? Yeah, I guess that this would be the the um, the most disease relevant. Um, however, uh, in our in our group, we don't have so much experience with IPS neurons, and so um, experiments that we'll be doing uh, maybe we'll start with just you know a subset of these mutations that we introduce into constructs similar to what I've done, um, maybe in a stable cell line because it is it is possible that the the mutation might take some time to, like you could see the effect of this cellular stress, kind of like in, in humans, you know, they're healthy for a good chunk of their life, but then neurodegeneration usually is kind of a late onset type of disorder. And so uh, we would have to find the best way to maybe, you know, mitigate this aging, you know, which is for, in this context, we, we do this through cellular stress. Maybe we have time for one more quick question um, by Bogdan Polobota. Do you know whether any R in RGG motifs of FUS are methylated? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Um, so we, I, it, it's assumed that probably most of the arginines within the RGG motifs are methylated in cells kind of ubiquitously and at all times. And so it's um, the methylation pattern of FUS is, uh, yeah, like the, the healthy cell would have a very highly methylated FUS. And actually in FDD patients, yeah, it's the case that we 
we see a loss of this methylation and it's it's unclear what is causing this, um, but it's it's definitely something that, that our lab is interested in looking into um, and is, yeah, an important component of this whole story of us for sure. Great, thanks again, Erin. You have a bunch of other questions in the, in the chat you can answer and we can move on to the next speaker. Perfect, thank you. Um, who is uh, Nadesh Tapodwanaya. Uh, so Nadia, she's a graduate student in the Ketting Lab in the Institute of Molecular Biology. Uh, Nadia has a background uh, in chemical technology and biotechnology from Moscow, Russia, where she did her bachelor and master's in developing fluorescence-based sensors for the detection of um, poly ADP ribose. In the Ketting lab, as a graduate student, she is spearheading work on the uh, biogenesis of um, small non-coding RNAs called pyRNAs using this novel nuclease complex book that she will be talking about today. So with that, I invite Nadia to um, start her seminar. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ravinda, for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to present here my uh, PhD work. And before I start, I'd like to say that this work had been done in a close collaboration with uh, Sebastian Falk from Vienna, who performed most of the protein work uh, for this project. As most of you know, uh, genomes of many organisms contain a lot of transposable elements. And human genome is not an exception. About 45% of human genome consists of transposons. Uh, transposons are Japan genes, and they are capable to change their location in the genome. Not all the remaining copies are active. However, those which are active are endangering uh, genome integrity. A new insertion of transposable elements can happen in the middle of the uh, gene coding sequence or inside of the important uh, regulatory region. And when it happens in the somatic cell, it can cause either cell death or maybe uh, starting of a cancer. However, when transposon reactivation happens in the germline, it can lead uh, to immediate sterility. That's why it is very important to protect the germline from transposons. Not only transposons which are already integrated in the genome is a threat for uh, the genome. Uh, right now, in a color population, there are uh, four different uh, retroviral elements, and transposons are spreading both horizontally and vertically, and it's uh, pretty much dangerous for the color population. I'm, uh, for fortunately, there is a system uh, which helps protect the germline from transposon reactivation. Uh, and it is based on the special kind of RNAs, which are called pyRNAs. PyRNAs are small RNAs which are acting together with a special clade of argonaut proteins, which are called PV. Based on the complementarity of uh, PyRNA towards the uh, transposable RNA target, PV protein can recognize the transposon and set it for degradation. Um, this is how the protection works. And it is very important to produce PyRNAs properly because um, organism is a uh, in a need to protect self genes from non self genes and uh, decide what to silence, what not to silence, and uh, proper production of pyrenees is really necessary for it. I'm studying uh, pyrenees formation in uh, C. elegans, and C. elegans is a great model for this because, um, unlike uh, other organisms, loss of pyrenees in C. elegans doesn't cause immediate sterility, uh, rather reduced uh, fertility, which fades during the generations, um, and it's called mortal germline phenotype, which gives us the opportunity to um, study it within several generations. Pyrenees in C. elegans are transcribed in, as individual precursors from two clusters on the uh, chromosome 4 by um, uh, RNA polymerase 2, and um, these individual precursors have M7 G cap, two extra nucleotides on the 5 prime end, and several nucleotides on the 3 prime end. Uh, pyrenees in C. elegans are called 21 urna because they are 21 nucleotide long and have strong 5 prime U bias. It is not exactly known how um, 5 prime end of 21 urnase is processed. However, recently our lab identified a complex which we named Petisco, 
uh, which somehow takes part in five prime end processing. After this process, twenty uh, one U RNA is loaded to P irg one, which is the main PV protein in C elegans. Uh, after three prime end processing, P irg one uh, together with twenty one U RNA is recognizing the transcript for transposons and uh, start the silencing process. And uh, today, I'm happy to tell you a story how we were searching for the nuclease, which is, which is performing this uh, five prime end modification of uh, 21 urna precursors in C. elegans, and how we found it. Uh, we started from Petisco complex, which, sh uh, which showed reduction in uh, precursor level. And um, this protein complex consists of many proteins with multiple possibilities of RNA binding. Uh, not only RM domains of TOFU6 and P3 are capable of binding RNAs, P3 also carries a mid domain, which is capable of binding 5' prime phosphate of um, RNA. IFO3, this uh, small protein, is capable of binding uh, selectively M7G cap of the precursors. And we proved that uh, Petisco complex is indeed capable of binding these precursors. However, we are not able to identify a nuclease amount Petisco protein complex. So we kept looking. And uh, fortunately for us, C. elegans is a very well studied organism. And a lot of genetic screens had been done already. And in 2014, one group performed a screen uh, based on RNAi, in which they identified two candidates, two proteins, uh, deletion of which showed accumulation of precursors. So exactly that uh, effect we would expect if uh, nuclease would be missing. They named these proteins TOFU1 and TOFU2. However, uh, this group was not also able to identify any nuclease-like domains in TOFU1 and TOFU2 proteins, so it was left as it is. When we um, analyzed these proteins with simple blast, we didn't see anything suspicious. However, when we uh, performed uh, structural-based uh, studies, we found that both TOFU1 and TOFU2 contain some domains which are annotated like Schlaffen domains. And then we looked into what Schlaffen domains actually are, we found that there is a huge uh, family of proteins, relatively uh, new proteins, uh, which are called Schlaffen from German to sleep. And some of these proteins had been proven to have uh, tRNAs and rRNAs uh, activity. And homology between Schlaffen uh, domains of TOFU1 and TOFU2 was the closest one to Schlaffen satin, which is human tRNAs endonuclease. Let's look uh, a bit closer to the structure of uh, Schlaffen domains of TOFU1 and TOFU2. While catalytic center of Schlaffen satin consists of two lobes uh, <clears throat> connected via binding domain, each of TOFU1 and TOFU2 proteins possesses only one Schlaffen uh, domain. Therefore, we thought, OK, maybe these two proteins come together and um, act together as one uh, Schlaffen protein. Catalytic center of Schlaffen satin uh, is also located in only one uh, side. So here you can see it in the red dots uh, on the C lobe of Schlaffen satin. We looked at the sequence and we found that uh, necessary catalytic residues of Schlaffen satin are conserved in TOFU2, not only sequence wise, but also when we made an alpha fold structure alignment of um, TOFU2 Schlaffen domain against a Schlaffen uh, satin, we found that structurally this uh, catalytic center is also aligning together. We checked with the IP mass spec experiment uh, for TOFU2, that uh, TOFU2 is interacting with TOFU1, and it is. And we moved um, to uh, in vivo for making mutations. We uh, introduced a mutation in worms with CRISPR-Cas9 into one of the amino acid residues, which were crucial for uh, Schlaffen satin function. Uh, we checked that the level of the protein uh, is not affected, and uh, we crossed this uh, point mutant strain with a 21 urna sensor. 21 urna sensor consists of uh, M-cherry protein fused to F uh, H2B, followed by 21 urna recognition site. 
In case of healthy worms, which are having a perfectly working uh, PyRNA system, this transcript will, nev will be never uh, translated because it will be destroyed before, and we would not uh, observe any fluorescence. In case of compromised PyRNA system, we will see fluorescence of M-cherry fused to H2B, so it will be a very special pattern. What we saw is that fluorescence uh, was indeed there, and TOFU 2-point mutant was compar uh, comparably bright uh, as uh, fluorescence in the PRG1 uh, deletion worms. And PRG1 is the main PV protein, so no PRG1, no PyRNAs, nothing. Okay, we were pretty encouraged with the results, and we moved towards uh, small RNA sequencing. And we found that in our point mutant for TOFU2, where just, we just mutated uh, one amino acid in the potential catalytic center, we saw that uh, there is literally no mature pyrenees at all. And at the same time, we observed uh, a strong accumulation of the precursors. So precursors were upregulated. So basically, just by introducing one single point mutant, we were able to uh, reconstruct the whole phenotype of the deletion. Uh, we were pretty sure that our hypothesis that TOFU1 is interacting with TOFU2 and the form nuclease was right, and we moved in vitro. Uh, we obtained a synthetic pyRNA precursor. We labeled it uh, with radioactivity on the 3' end, and uh, we managed to purify TOFU1 and TOFU2 from insect cells, and we mixed it together in 100,000 different conditions and nothing happened. However, we were pretty sure that um, our hypothesis is right. So we were uh, starting to look what we are missing here, and maybe there is another component which is necessary. We reanalyzed our mass spec data, and we found that in this mass spec, there are two other proteins, which we named later Schlaffen-like 3 and Schlaffen-like 4. And both of these proteins also contain Schlaffen domain. Uh, we looked a bit closer in these proteins, and we found that these two proteins are most uh, mostly identical. Their sequence is very, very close, and there is no surprise that they were not really identified in any screens because it's a result of a recent gene duplication. So not many mutations were there, and they are pretty similar, and their function is relatively redundant, so it's kind of hard to identify um, the protein when it has a backup. Then we ran an alpha fold prediction for all these three proteins, TOFU1, TOFU2, and schlafen like 3 or schlafen like 4 I will here mention just schlafen like 3 because, yeah, they are basically similar. And we found that these three proteins are forming uh, a stable trimer. And we named this complex PUH, which stands for precursors of uh, 21 URNA, 5 prime and cleavage hollow enzyme. We moved to our in vitro assay already with three proteins. However, purification of TOFU1 and TOFU2 was already hard enough, so we chose here another approach. We uh, overexpressed from the plasmids TOFU1, TOFU2, schlafen like 3 or schlafen like 4 in uh, Bombix Mori avarian cells and made an IP. And this material we used further for our cleavage reactions. Um, and what we observed is that um, so here on the left side, you see um, the just synthetic precursor and the cleavage product as we expected. We observed that only when all three components, uh, TOFU1, TOFU2, and schlafen like 3 or schlafen like 4 are present in the reaction, we are able to see the cleavage of 21 urna precursor. And uh, great for us, we also observed that um, this point mutant, which we introduced in TOFU2 and which showed us a complete absence of uh, pioneer precursors in vivo, in vitro is also completely abolishes the cleavage. Okay, then we thought that cleavage by our new nucleus PUH should be really specific because it's just not great to have in your system protein complex, which just chops a uh, cap and two nucleotides from all your RNA. I need to mention that uh, in C. elegans, uh, a lot of uh, mRNAs are actually transplaced. So they do not carry M7G cap, but rather TMG cap. But still, there are some uh, RNAs left which are having M7G cap. And that's why we thought some features of the pyRNA precursors must be necessary for the cleavage. 
First, we looked into this um, U in the position three. As I said, all 21 uh, U RNAs start from U. That's why we decided to mutate this U in the precursor. And when we mutated this for C, we observed that cleavage is completely uh, abolished. Next nucleotide we checked was the first nucleotide because in the position one, there is only uh, less than 1% of C. And we observed that even though cleavage is happening, it happens much slower comparing to the canonical AAU uh, substrate. As I said before, um, most of uh, RNA in C. elegans is transplaced. Therefore, we decided to check if M7G cap is also necessary. Therefore, we used a substrate carrying uh, TMG cap, and uh, there was also no cleavage. And when there is no cap at all, we just had five prime phosphate on our RNA. We didn't observe any cleavage uh, at all too. So basically we found that there is two major features. We need to have U in the position three, and we need to have M7G cap. As I said before, we identified a protein complex, which we named Petisco. And this Petisco complex is capable of binding 21 urna precursors. So we decided to investigate the link between a PUH complex and Petisco complex. First, what we've done, we repeated our small RNA sequencing, but we made a second um, strain where we had TOFU2 point mutant together with PID1 mutant. PID1 is a central protein here which binds the Petisco complex and brings Petisco towards its function uh, in pyRNA uh, processing. And uh, for the mature pyRNA level, we didn't see any differences because we had a catalytic mutant, so TOFU2 was not able to process RNA. However, when we looked at the precursors level, uh, Again, tofu, uh, two point, in TOFU two-point mutant, the level of precursors was upregulated, but in PID1 TOFU2 double mutant, we were not able to observe any upregulations. Therefore, we uh, concluded that um, most probably Petisco complex is needed for uh, stability of the precursors and protection them from the degradation. Uh, we haven't seen any um, Petisco protein components in our IP for PUH complex and vice versa. But it was not kind of surprising because very often um, interaction with enzymes are transient. Therefore, we again moved to in vitro approach and we performed an MBP pull down for TOFU1 together with components for Petisco complex. <laughs> and we found that, okay, when we have MBP TOFU1 and when we do a pull down, we managed to elude all Petisco complex components together. So probably TOFU1 in a, a PUH complex is responsible for binding Petisco. We managed to nail down the interaction for the single proteins. We found that TOFU1 is actually interacting with the Tudor domain of TOFU6 from Petisco. And uh, we uh, obtained a crystal structure of this interaction. Uh, we identified uh, necessary amino acids, which are involved in the interaction between two complexes. And uh, we created in vivo mutations in worms later, and we performed small RNA sequences of that. So basically, while in the wild type, we saw like a normal amount of uh, mature pyRNAs, in our point mutants in TOFU1 and TOFU6 and in uh, double, which should prevent uh, both complexes, PUH complex and Petisco complex from interacting. We saw a significant redundance or re significant reduction of the level of pyRNAs. At the same time, uh, we observed a small accumulation of the precursors um, in the point mutants. So basically disruption of interaction between Petisco and uh, PUH causes um, a very strong phenotype. Um, yeah. Another interesting thing is a localization of PUH proteins. Uh, both schlafen like 3 and schlafen like 4 contain transmembranal domain. We still haven't managed to see where it's located in worms, but we overexpress these proteins in um, Bombix mori uh, avarian cells, which we used also for IP. And um, 
on top, you see a uh, full length slough and like uh, three protein uh, expressed together with all components of Puch complex. And uh, below, you see um, slough and like three with deleted uh, transmembranal domain. And we can see that um, in Bombix Mori cells, uh, slough and like three together with the whole Puch complex is localizing on the membrane of the mitochondria. And it's interesting because um, it is known that, for instance, in Drosophila, um, the nucleus, which is processing pyranase, is also located in the mitochondria. However, there is no uh, anyhow connection between the structure of uh, Drosophila uh, protein, uh, which is called zucchini, and the uh, Puch complex. They, there is a completely different uh, biological mechanism how they process pyranase. And somehow this link to the mitochondria is still needed to be investigated. So I'd like uh, what I told you that we found um, a new nucleus, uh, which we named Puch. This nucleus is processing pyranase in C. elegans. And we found how uh, this new complex Puch is uh, bound to Petisco, the complex we identified before, and how they are connected. And uh, it was the last unknown um, process in uh, pyrene precursor uh, processing. Thanks a lot for your attention and um, <coughs> and uh, I'm really grateful for Rene for this wonderful project and for all people who helped me um, with this and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Nadia. That was a really great talk. Uh, let's just wait a couple minutes for people to ask their questions. Maybe I can, oh, okay, there's a question from Ildar. Great work. When in evolution did nematodes start using Schlafen domains for making pyramids? Sorry again? When in evolution, did nematodes start using Schlafen domains for making pyrenees? So this is actually an interesting thing because um, many organisms have uh, Schlafen-like domains, small ones. And it is the first example of how these small Schlafen-like like domains can come together and assemble um, something which is actually working. So. I'm not quite sure. I think the whole uh, blade, uh, which has pyranase, uh, would be like processed by these proteins. But also, um, a lot, as I said, like there are a lot of different small schlafen like domains, and uh, no one actually knows what they're doing. So, for instance, in prokaryotic argonauts, there are also schlafen uh, domains. And no one also knows what they're doing. So maybe it's pretty um, old uh, conserved mechanism, but there is really no data because it's literally the first one. But the association of Schlafen with the tofu proteins, perhaps you can comment on how, how conserved the tofu proteins are the Pedishko complexes in nematodes? So it's basically like, um, relatively concerned for the whole clade. So if you have pyranase, most probably you have uh, tofu. Okay. Um, I also have a question because you mentioned that the book complex is localizing to the mitochondria. What is your hypothesis on uh, this uh, process that you need a nucleus in the mitochondrial membrane? So this is actually interesting because there was a recent data that another protein which is involved in uh, pyrene pathway, TOFO7, is uh, also localized on mitochondria. So maybe it is something like this. But besides that, I mean, mitochondria is just um, maybe just a bit high in the temperature and it helps to speed up the reaction. So it can be simply that. Or maybe it's some, again, um, phase separation issues. Maybe there are some special granules. We really have no data about this. So it can be from the simple uh, catalytic uh, heating up the reaction till, yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions. One from Astrid Haas. Congratulations on this beautiful work. 
is this new nuclease also involved in processing of other cellular RNA, perhaps connected to a more general RNA decay? So overall, um, UH by itself, I do not really think so because the requirements for the substrate is relatively strict. Um, eukaryotic uh, Schlafen proteins, which are known so far and have been characterized, are capable to process a lot of different types of RNAs, but it's also a relatively new field. So for instance, uh, most uh, characterized Schlafen proteins are Schlafen 8, Schlafen 13, and something else, are participating in the innate immune response against viruses, and they are just capable to cleave um, tRNA based on the uh, rare codon bias. Um, more I cannot say because like really this is a very first nucleus of this kind, can, uh, which is made of several independent Schlafen-like small domains. But I assume that, uh, yeah, it's just needs to like, just we need to wait some time and uh, gain more information about like, because there are really many of, of those small Schlafen like things in the genomes. Another question by Xiao Hong Kuang. Great work. Do Puch and Petishko co localize in germline cells? And which one happens first, the five prime end or three prime end processing? So we think that uh, first happens five prime end processing because we don't see PRG1 anywhere in our data and we know that three uh, prime end processing happens already on PRG1. Uh, we are now working on the localization of uh, PUH. So yes, it's what we are doing now. I cannot say yet. But um, I mean, Petisco is mostly in uh, pig granules anyway, so we will see. I think we have uh, some more time for the next questions. We have a question by Anikesh Panik. Wonderful work. Did you find any homologs of such nucleases to human cells? Um, so basically, uh, yes. Um, all this full lens Schlafen proteins, which are consist of two lobes, right away are in human cells, and they are many. Uh, also, human genome encodes two other small Schlafen-like domains. However, they are pretty hard to identify, so maybe there are more, or maybe not. And maybe those two are uh, somehow um, performing some work as well and form a nucleus. But that's, I don't know, because it's pretty new field, as I said. But uh, big uh, Schlafen proteins, which like encoded as one protein as a catalytic center, are there, and uh, there are several of them. Um, last question by Ildar. Do you have any data that helps understand how uridine is recognized in the catalytic center? And congratulations on the wonderful work. So I think the like exact processing and maybe uh, I don't know crystallization of the uh, Puch complex components together with the substrate will come later. So for now we just uh, managed to get this data with the mutation. It's pretty pretty recent and new. So I really uh, don't have an idea now, but uh, yeah. So we also will investigate that. Great. Actually, we have another question by Chen Ming Zhu. Uh, thank you for the interesting work. Have you checked the localization of tofu one slash two in worms still in mitochondria? So that's what I'm doing now. I'm trying to tag uh, tofu one and tofu two to see whether uh, it's localized to mitochondria. I would assume that yes, but I mean it's just like my expectation. But uh, like. Ask me in a couple of months. But are there any uh, particular domains in these proteins that causes mitochondrial localization? No, but uh, these proteins are really not really stable uh, without each other. And uh, we assume that their concentration is kind of more or less equal in the germline. And that's what I see when I try to overexpress them in Bombix Moria cells. And um, also like when I want to get the protein I just can get them all together. So I would assume that if Schlafen like three localizes to mitochondria, TOF1 and TOF2 just go there. 
I see. Well, thank you again, Natia, for this fantastic talk. And um, for everyone, I mean, thank you for joining today. Um, you can, as you must have seen in the beginning, you can view these talks later on the YouTube channel for RNA Collaborative. Uh, and yeah, see you in another two weeks for the next meeting.